Okay, time for Sinister 2. Oh. Um, okay. That is no problem. <sighs> Sequels are an inevitability in a lot of cases when a movie is successful, even if it's often the case that the story works best as a one-off. Sinister has an ending that brought the story full circle and didn't leave me feeling like I needed more to make it all feel complete. I know a lot of people did find the ending of that movie to be too abrupt, but aside from the lame jump scare in the last shot, I've always thought the ending was fantastic with a great sense of dread brought on by this sucker punch from Bagul. Well, it was made for a measly $3 million and did pretty well at the box office, so the following year, a sequel was announced with Scott Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill returning to write, but instead of Derrickson taking the helm as director again, Irish filmmaker Kieran Foy was brought on. I consider Sinister to be one of the most effective horror movies out there. I use other words to describe Sinister 2. Good evening. My name's Evan and welcome to Rockland Graves. Before we get into the movie, I need to thank you all for the absolutely ludicrous support on the Sinister video. I was completely caught off guard by the reception to that review since the channel was moving at a snail's pace for a while and Sinister is a 12 year old movie that doesn't get talked about a ton so when it skyrocketed to being my most viewed video and doubled my subscriber count in two weeks, it was a huge shot. We're at like four, we're like quadrupled the size now. This is ridiculous. So thank you, it, it really means a lot. It's a video I've wanted to make since I started the channel and I'm overjoyed that so many of you resonated with it. Overall, I had only good things to say about the movie, save for a few issues here and there. This video is gonna have a bit of a different tone to it and that's because we're talking about the only sequel to ever release to Sinister. And I think Sinister 2 is a really great example of what it looks like when a sequel almost completely misses the point of its predecessor. Sinister 2 takes the disturbing, eerie, and mysterious tone of the first and throws it out the window, opting instead to up the ante on the snuff films and focus heavily on the demon children while throwing in an absurd amount of cheap jump scares to punctuate scenes for almost no reason. It's a pretty big step back from the first movie, but there are one or two things about it that I think make it worth at least considering a watch. So let's take a closer look. I think comparing the opening scenes in Sinister to Sinister 2 really sums up the differences between these movies. The opening shot of Sinister is one of the most chilling and memorable openings to any horror movie with this 8mm footage of a family being hung from a tree in their backyard. The footage is slowed down just enough to give it this dark, creepy, dreamlike feel and the soundscape of Oliver's silence teaches you how to sing really ties it all together. It's such a gripping first shot that perfectly sets the tone for the rest of the movie and I can at least say that the latter is still true for Sinister 2. This is definitely a good indicator of what to expect for this sequel. For whatever reason, Dylan here is dreaming in 16mm film stock. You get a good taste of how the tapes in this movie try and just amp up the insanity as we watch this family all tied to crosses in the middle of a cornfield get torched up, which jolts Dylan awake where he's met by Bagul in his closet and a jump scare of a creepy kid behind him. These two openings really are the spark notes comparison between Sinister and its sequel. Very unsubtle and convoluted murder, showing Bagul way too early and way too clearly, a cheap jump scare to top it all off? We're in for a ride. For obvious reasons, Sinister 2 doesn't follow Ellison Oswald. Instead, we meet a whole new family in the middle of a pretty intense custody battle between Courtney and her ex-sort of husband Clint over their twin sons Dylan and Zach. Courtney's got the boys hidden out on an abandoned farmhouse where they've been squatting to avoid Clint, who, for whatever reason, has so many authority figures in his pocket that he manages to convince multiple state troopers to try and illegally transfer the twins over to Clint. Once he manages to figure out where Courtney's hiding out, he shows up throughout the movie to try and get the boys through various means, and while I'm not saying people like this don't exist, he's kind of cartoonishly awful without ever showing more than one facial expression that would make you even remotely sympathize with him. One of the most important parts about telling a story where people's relationship has been broken is showing remnants of the connection they used to have. Granted, this heated custody battle would without a doubt be a really volatile period for them, but it would have helped if there had been even like a scene or two 
where he gets the kids aside and shows a different side of himself because we never really get anything except the angry, violent, and authoritarian prick. I want to be able to feel the stakes here, and giving Clint some more dimension would have been a good way of making that happen. That becomes especially obvious when it's contrasted by the relationship between Ellison and Tracy, which I just can't praise enough for how well the nuance was handled in their increasingly strained marriage. It's because we get to see the different layers to their relationship that it was so investing, and that feels like it's missing in this second movie. I will say though, while Ellison and Tracy's marriage was a pretty important part of the story in the first movie, Clint is barely in Sinister 2, and the focus is instead on Courtney trying to find a way to protect Dylan and Zack. It's more about that side of things than it is Courtney and Clint, so it's not as much of an issue as it could have been. I really enjoy the character dynamics in the first movie, which is why it's a shame that we're moving on from them. Yeah, he's back! Deputy so-and-so makes a very... <laughs> Deputy so-and-so makes a very welcome return, and while I really liked his character in the first movie, I think he's even better in Sinister 2, largely because we just spend a hell of a lot more time with him. Does this place really spook you that much? No, nah, it's not like that. Yes, it really does. James Ransone is the only returning actor aside from Nicholas King reprising his role as Bagul. Still going only by his charming alias, so-and-so was the primary suspect in the deaths of the Oswald family initially, since he was really the only one coming and going from their house, and he was the last person Ellison made contact with. He was eventually cleared of his charges, but was fired from his position as deputy after the sheriff found out he was going behind his back and leaking evidence to Ellison, so he's been spending his time as a private investigator and trying to put a stop to the curse that Ellison got wrapped up in. That's how I've been stopping it. I've been burning the houses down. Wait, so the Oswald house? That was... Yeah. Here's the thing about Sinister 2. Most of this movie fails to capture anything that made the first good, and I'm gonna get into lots of that in a moment. But, where this sequel actually does pretty well is in the dynamic between Courtney and Deputy, ex-Deputy so-and-so I suppose, private detective so-and-so. He stumbles on them, intending to burn the house down since he's under the impression that it's vacant, and after he convinces Courtney that he wasn't sent by Clint, they begin developing a really sweet relationship that is by far the best thing about this movie. Honestly, my favorite scene of the whole thing has to be this one where they're sitting out on the porch after the kids go to bed, getting drunk and smoking secret cigarettes. Do you smoke? Uh, no. Not really. I'm, uh, this is a secret cigarette. These are the scenes where you can tell that Derrickson and Cargill wrote the screenplay, and it's these moments that made me realize that where the movie is largely a letdown is in how it's directed, because you can really feel the absence of Derrickson behind the camera. When we're just in these moments between characters, there's a heart and optimism to the movie that feels somewhat similar to the way these elements were handled in The Black Phone. That's a far better movie than this, but there are glimpses of that heart that makes Sinister 2 sometimes a tolerable movie. This isn't limited to the scenes between Courtney and so-and-so. I also really enjoyed the few scenes that so-and-so shares with Dr. Stomberg, an understudy to Professor Jonas who's been trying to figure out what happened after Jonas went missing and left behind his research into Bagul. Some of the humor actually works well, both thanks to the contributions from Derrickson and Cargill, but also largely because James Ransone plays this kind of personality so well. <laughs> Okay, you should probably destroy that thing. Like, soon. He's just such a great character actor, and this movie gives him a lot more time in the spotlight, which is something I genuinely really enjoy about it. There's some nice care put into the way these scenes are shot, the one I just mentioned between so-and-so and Courtney being a particular highlight. The camera starts wide at the beginning of their conversation, but once Courtney makes this comment... I'm not their dad. That's weird. That's weird. <laughs> Like, well, I wish you were. It then punches into these close-ups, showing how that sort of joke she just made dissolved some barrier between them, and now they're getting into a more intimate, personal discussion. I really appreciate that kind of care with the camera, and you can tell that Kieran Foy is pretty good with it. Also, I think that taking Sinister onto an isolated farmhouse is perfect. There was already such a great feeling of isolation and eeriness in that dark bungalow, and nice creepy farmland is one of my favorite aesthetics for horror that I don't feel like gets its proper due a lot of the time. Especially with the abandoned chapel on the property and a huge cornfield nearby, there's a ton of potential in this location for some of that beautiful eeriness that gave Sinister so much of its charm. I can absolutely see the tone of that first movie being perfectly transposed and expanded on in a location like this. It reminds me of that farm level from Slender the Arrival, which I absolutely love. So we've got a mostly strong cast of characters, a few great interactions between them, and a location that is perfectly suited to the brand of horror that Sinister provided. 
Which is what makes it such a shame that the actual horror side of this movie isn't just not up to the level of the first, it's actually pretty terrible. I shouldn't be watching this. Turn it off, Milo. Look, Sinister isn't a perfect movie. There are some well-executed jump scares, but there are also some that feel really forced and cheap that take away from the oppressive atmosphere of the movie. Then you've got the way the kids are shown too clearly and really aren't all that creepy. It's got some issues, but it's not too hard for me to look past them since most of how that movie handles its horror is incredibly effective. Sinister 2 is basically what happens if you take the worst parts of Sinister and lean all the way into them without having any of the really great stuff to outweigh it. This movie is stuffed to the brim with really gimmicky scares that don't feel like natural sequences progressing the story. They're essentially set piece scares shoved in every once in a while without much purpose. Here's where I think this movie really misunderstands what made the first good. It wasn't the jump scares or spooky kids that made Sinister frightening. It was the intense, dread-filled atmosphere driven by the nature of the story, the engaging and dark mystery, Ethan Hawke's great performance, as well as those horrifying snuff films and the movie's stellar soundtrack. A lot of comments were calling Sinister just another jump scare simulator, which really bothers me because that's disregarding so much of what made that movie as impactful as it is, but Sinister 2 would very accurately be described as a jump scare simulator for the most part. The scares are all really forgettable and are usually of little or no consequence, which makes them feel a lot like something to just pass the time between scenes instead of being integral to the story. Bagul works best when he's not shown too clearly, which is what makes images like when he's standing in the pool so creepy in the first one. He's got a design that's best used when your brain has to try and fill in the blanks on its own, but when he's shown really clearly, it's not anywhere near as effective, and Sinister 2 shows him pretty dead on in the first scene of the movie, and then doesn't even bother trying to keep his appearance vague after that. There is very little subtlety in this movie, which is a problem that extends into the snuff films. Speaking of, they suck. For the most part. First off, these are shot in 16mm, which isn't the end of the world or anything, but it doesn't give anywhere near the creepy feeling that the 8mm footage in the first movie did. These tapes look too clear and a hell of a lot less dreamlike, especially when they start using CGI that completely ruins the illusion. What made these scenes so horrifying previously was that these were all very believable and grounded murders that felt like you were watching something you're not supposed to see which puts you right in Ellison's shoes. They're the scariest thing about Sinister, and in the sequel, they're mostly just really convoluted, over-the-top kills that don't elicit nearly the same believability and are really damn forgettable. A simple out-of-focus throat slit in the first movie is exponentially more impactful than hanging a family upside down and having alligators bite their heads. I don't even know how a child managed to set up a lot of these murders. They're so unnecessarily over-the-top, which takes away so much from their effectiveness. Sure, it's brutal to watch this family nailed to a church floor have rats crawl through their stomachs, but because it's so crazy, it feels less believable. The only one I actually do quite like in this movie is Christmas Morning, and I don't think it's any coincidence that it's the most subdued one. We see this family opening up Christmas presents, and then cut to them all buried in snow with only their heads exposed, and as the kid gets close-ups of their frostbitten faces, the video ends with the reveal that one of them is still alive when they breathe out and look into the camera. Now that's effective. And it's really the only one where you feel some of that DNA from the first film. It's also nice to hear another Oliver song because Silence teaches you how to sing made up a pretty good chunk of the first movie's music. This is not saved from the same album, and it's tonally perfect for a Christmas murder. It doesn't just feel aggressive and creepy, it feels really sad, which is something that's sorely missing from most of these films. I talked a lot about the soundscape of Sinister, and I do want to touch on it a bit here. It's not terrible by any means, and there are some great picks in the soundtrack, but there's something really missing from the atmosphere, and I think a lot of that comes down to the music picks in this movie seeming to be more generic creepy score instead of the shit Cargill and Derrickson found in the strangest corners of the internet in the middle of the night. Like the films in that movie, the music sounded like something you weren't supposed to hear, almost like you were listening to a cult meeting in the distance. A lot of the soundscape here sounds like the sort of thing you'd find in just a few minutes if you googled creepy music and didn't hit anywhere near the same way. It's not terrible though, and there are some great highlights, but overall it feels less otherworldly than before. I also don't think these films did as good a job at switching the music when we go from the stalking halves of the films to the actual murders. Those transitions didn't feel as creepy as they did before, and a lot of that is because the music will often just stay exactly the same. Honestly, the films in this movie really feel like fluff whereas they felt 
absolutely core to the tone and the impact of the first movie. They're here out of necessity and feel a lot less inspired and really don't do much to add to the overall experience. Now obviously, we're not getting to see these through Ellison's eyes this time around, so instead what Sinister 2 decided to do was to approach the horror from the perspective of the kids who are being manipulated by Bagul and his minions, and while I think conceptually there's some cool angles to take there, the way this stuff is executed is absolutely terrible. I think it could have been kind of interesting to have the manipulation be the focus if this wasn't marketed as a sinister sequel, and we just had them move into a new house where they meet some local kids, and slowly throughout the movie are coerced and twisted to the point where they finally fall into this dark trap, and then end the movie with a film of their family before another canister is placed in the box, only revealing at the end that what that the whole movie was a sequel to Sinister. There could have been so much emotion and psychological horror in a story like that, but the way it's actually handled is so annoyingly cheesy, it borders on laughable at times. We see the ghost kids way too early on and know exactly who and what they are, which removes any suspense whatsoever from their presence. It also really doesn't help that Dylan and Zach are aware of the ghost kids before we even meet them, so we get this weird lingering question about why they never got freaked out by these kids appearing in their house or never told their mom about it. I like unanswered questions, but there's gotta be some substance and intrigue to make that work. And here it just feels like we're missing something. It seems like such an obvious approach to try and explore the gradual manipulation of these kids, but instead they just show up every once in a while to show Dylan tapes until he says he's done, and they bring Zack in instead, which was apparently their plan all along. I get that the point was that they knew what Zack was like, so they got to him by pretending they wanted Dylan the whole time, which they knew would push Zack further and further to a point where he'd do anything to get in with them, but it's not well enough explained why he'd even want to be, and it still feels like a lot of this is just missing. I actually really like the idea of their manipulation tactic, but it's not nearly well enough executed to actually work and have the emotional impact that it should have. The brothers are such shallow, good guy, bad guy characters that you never really grow to care what happens one way or another. The ghost kids talk like Bond villains constantly, with the most evil cookie cutter ghost dialogue that just drives me crazy. There is nothing remotely interesting unsettling or unique about how they're portrayed, and every time they're on screen, I just want them to be gone as soon as possible. Thankfully, sometimes they'll just fade away in the middle of a scene, so wish granted. Sinister was a PG-13 movie that really felt like it should have been rated R, but Sinister 2 feels like a movie designed for a much younger audience. To go out on a Friday night for some candy horror and these kinds of things are a huge part of that. There is one more scene I want to praise before we close things off, and that's what directly follows Zack finally setting up that murder that Dylan was dreaming about at the start of the movie. Clint managed to gain custody of the boys, so they're taken to his house where Zack begins his film. I've got to say, seeing him just stand in plain sight here like he's hidden was an irritating moment, but move past that. He drugs the family just as the kids in the first did, but before he's knocked out, Dylan sneaks Courtney's phone and sends a text to so-and-so asking for his help, and he shows up just in the nick of time to disrupt Zack's plans, but not before Clint is taken out. He was a shallow and pretty pointless character anyway, and this confirms that. He was shoved into the movie so that Courtney and the boys would have to leave the farmhouse, therefore giving the green light for the murders. There's some sinister lore there. Not all caught up on that. I, I talked about it a bit more in my review of the first movie. Anyway, the scene that I was talking about actually liking is when so and so cuts Courtney and Dylan down from their crosses and a chase ensues through the cornfield. Gyroscope by Boards of Canada makes a welcome return to this scene, and I think it's a huge reason why it works. Zach's chasing them with a scythe, and we don't hear anything aside from the music, except for a few brief moments where we break away from Zach's camera. The scene actually got under my skin a bit with some of that good, good dreadfulness that made the first movie so good. So and so loses half of his fucking hand in the chase, and I'd say overall, this is probably the most effective scene in the whole movie from a horror standpoint. There's a really over the top, goofy sequence where the ghost kids just throw shit around the house. Ooga booga, I guess. Anyway, Zack's camera is destroyed, and since he failed in his mission, he's seemingly killed by Bagul, and considering Courtney's son just died, it seems very odd that we basically get nothing to show that emotion aside from her just falling over in the front yard. The movie ends with Deputy So-and-So presumably sticking around with Courtney and Dylan to help mend the wounds, but he makes a stop at the motel he's been at to grab some things before the radio starts doing some cheese shit to tease a sequel that's probably never coming because this movie flopped like a fish. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the first movie didn't exactly close off in the best way. I like the ending overall, but the jump scare is really stupid. This isn't any better. So that's Sinister 2. I don't hate this movie. 
And I think especially after coming off of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, and The Omen 4, there are some things that I genuinely really like about it. The location is fantastic, some of the score is solid, there are one or two moments that I think are genuinely really good, but overall, this feels like a shell of its former self, trying to grab hold of some of the success of the first movie, but failing in almost every way. It's not remotely scary, aside from that one chase sequence. The home movies are very forgettable. You know what really hurts with this one? I can see where the screenplay could have been great. A lot of these individual story beats have potential, but it's in the execution where they get cheapened to the point that the movie becomes frustrating. The custody battle is an interesting way to eventually force Courtney and the boys out of the house, but Clint is such an underdeveloped and tacked on character solely there to eventually drive that plot line that it doesn't really work. I like how the kids use Zack's violent nature against him by intentionally isolating him from their clique and showing him that they want his brother instead until he snaps and they know he'll do what they want, but the kids are so cheesy and the twins so one-dimensional that it doesn't feel as compelling as it should have. I really like this moment when Dylan realizes that the drinks are drugged and he starts panicking on this hazy summer afternoon. I absolutely get the intended vibe of this scene, and if the rest of the movie was more cohesive, this would have been a really disturbing moment. There are so many ideas in this movie that I think could have worked so well, but the execution of them falls so flat that none of it works aside from some of the character dynamics. I can see the disturbing storyline written by Derrickson and Cargill, and if that had been pulled off properly, it would have been a fantastic sequel, and that's the most disappointing kind of movie. There's so much potential, and almost none of it is realized. I get the urge to watch it randomly every once in a blue moon, but aside from Deputy So-and-So and his dynamic with Courtney, this movie ranges from forgettable to straight-up annoying, so unless you're willing to put up with that for the sake of the handful of things the movie does well, there's not much reason to give Sinister 2 a watch. I don't like this movie but I like some things about it. I doubt it's gonna come back anytime soon, but I wouldn't be surprised if Blumhouse tried to pull another Sinister sequel out of their ass at some point down the line. I really hope the Black Phone 2 isn't a repeat of how Sinister 2 went, but only time will tell on that one. Next up, I'll be covering the 2006 remake of The Omen, which will be the last video I make for the franchise before the new one drops, so keep an eye out for that. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.